Okay, right. We, wonderful recordings working. We're just going to go live on Facebook as well. And then we will make a start. Okay, give me a moment. Make sure I share it on the right space. There we go. Okay, we should be going live on Facebook. Just a moment. And then we'll make a start. Okay, wonderful. We're now live on Facebook, everybody. So thank you very much everybody, for joining us. This event has been brought to you as a collaboration between the Living Rainforest, Trust for Sustainable Living and also Zoolab. My name is Kirsty Shakespeare and I'm the International Education for Sustainable Development Manager at the Trust for Sustainable Living, which is a UK based charity, but we work globally with students and teachers around the world to promote sustainability education and encourage young people and teachers to get involved with the conversation on sustainability topics. And I'm gonna hand you over to Georgie, who's my co-host for this meeting with uh, Zulab. Georgie, can you hear us, are you there? Georgie, you're muted. Thank you. Sorry, I uh, left the meeting there when uh, you start, hit record for some reason. So I'm Dropped back. Thank you. Uh, sorry about that. So um, my name is Georgie. I am uh, from Zulab. I am the uh, product development manager and presenter. Uh, and what can I say? Um, Kirsty and I had a vision. Um, we Our vision was to empower as many students as possible to look at their local area and to identify sustainability issues that are impacting the environment and to explore possible solutions and then present this in an engaging way as possible through video footage. Um, and Kirsty, I think we can say that the students have certainly delivered, haven't they? Yeah, they absolutely did. We had over 85 entries from 19 countries across the world, a mixture of individuals, students and school groups and community groups as well. And it's really inspiring to think that all of these students and teachers are recognising that these sustainability challenges exist and looking at considering solutions for them. So we need to say a huge thank you and well done to everyone that took part. Thank you for all of your efforts um, and the amazing film work that you put into this. We've got the opportunity to see some of the videos from the top five primary and secondary categories as part of the event. And we're also going to be announcing the winner. Exciting at the end of our event today as well. So we also need to introduce our speakers. You will see uh, three of our speakers that are with us today. We have Lynn, Anthea, and Ingrid. I'm just going to introduce them one by one and they will be doing their presentations a little later. Um, our speakers will be talking about sustainability issues in their local area or in an area of interest or concern to them and they will be open to questions too. Two of our speakers have also been judges in our video competitions uh, before and we will also have a speaker who is a, a TSL uh, alumni competition winner uh, and has just completed her thesis on an interesting sustainability challenge. So firstly, we would like to say a big thank you again for taking your time out today and, and joining us and allowing us to hear about your sustainability challenges. So the first speaker I'm going to introduce, uh, if we can spotlight Kirsty, thank you, is Lynn, Dr. Lynn McTavish, uh, who's over in South Africa. Uh, Dr. Lynn McTavish is a reserve manager at Manqui Wildlife Reserve. She has been working in conservation for the past 23 years and was recently awarded an honorary doctorate of science by the University of Brighton in England in recognition of her major contributions to wildlife conservation and promotion of conservation science at the highest level. Lynn's main focus turned to rhino conservation since the tragic rhino poaching that took place on her reserve in 2014. She vowed that her five rhinos did not die in vain and promised to be their voice in the hope that their deaths would perhaps one day save the rhino from extinction. Ever since the tragedy, Lynn works with the media to spread awareness and was recently appointed to the Rhino Alive Board. She has also presented to the South African government and was asked to speak on behalf of the Private Rhino Association at the CITES Convention in 2016. 
Her story has been featured in the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Reddit and several others. She has been interviewed by the BBC, ABC News, Nightline, Inside Edition, AFP, NHK, among others, and has participated in several Rhino documentaries. Lynn is also a lecturer in ecology and teaches approximately 300 students a year about the importance of managing and the entire ecosystem and has co-authored many publications. I personally have also been lucky enough to visit Mankwe in South Africa with uh, some colleagues of mine at Zulab. We spent a week there and I have personally witnessed the valuable work being done at the reserve. So a great big thank you and welcome to Lynn. Thank you, it's lovely to be here and I'm looking forward to sharing our story about Mankwe and the rhinos later on. Fantastic, thank you. thank you. And we're looking forward to hearing more about it as well. Our second speaker this morning is Ingrid Henrys. So Ingrid has a master's degree in international agro development and engineering, but also a master's degree in tropical area biodiversity and conservation. She took a permaculture design course in California and was the head of national sanitation department in Haiti for over two years before she began working with international NGOs. She's also been the scientific and technical coordinator at the Makaya National Natural Park between 2014 and 2017, and the programme director for, for the Society Audubon Haiti that manages the Guan, Grand Bois, I hope I've pronounced that right, National Natural Park. She's been based in Gambia since 2021, where she was uh, the in-country project coordinator for waste aid, delivering circular economy solutions in the waste management sector, where she's now working as an independent consultant. So thank you very much for joining us, Ingrid. Welcome. Uh, before Ingrid speaks, Kirsty, would you be able to spotlight Ingrid? I'm afraid where I left, I'm no longer co-host and I can't do that. I'm sorry. Yes, many apologies. Sorry, Ingrid. There we go. Thank you. I am very happy to be here today and I'm looking forward to have a great event today. That's th thank you very much, Ingrid. OK, and last but no means least, of course, is our final speaker. We would like to welcome Anthea Lawrence. Anthea is an environmental engineering graduate from the University of Thrace. She is a Seychelles environmental activist who is particularly concerned with marine and coastal protection. She's just completed her thesis on improving coastal erosion protection in the Seychelles. Anthea has been an activist since she entered the TSL International Essay Competition and School Debates in 2012. She she helped to establish the Seychelles hub of the regional NGO, SID's Youth AMS Hub, SYAH. Her work led to her being recognised as one of the 28 young individuals making a difference in Seychelles, in the Seychelles. So a welcome to Anthea. Thank you, uh, uh, Georgie. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and I will love to share my findings of uh, my thesis with you. Lovely. Thank you, Anthea. Wonderful, thank you. So now we've introduced our speakers, we're going to get straight in and start hearing more about the sustainability challenges that they are working on and tackling. So we're going to hand straight back over to Lynn to hear more about the work that she has been doing at Mankwe in South Africa. Lynn, over to you when you're ready. If you need help with your screen sharing, let us know. Yeah, there we go, it's starting to load. Perfect. My name is Lynn oh, We're struggling a little with sound, Lynn. Can you hear us still? My name is Lynn McTavish okay. and the operations manager here for Hear Me Now. Yes, we can. Thank yeah. you, Lynn. Okay. So I'll, I'll start again. Uh, my name is Lynn McTavish and I've been operations manager at Monkey Wildlife Reserve for um, 23 years. And I'm very fortunate to now be managing and building on the legacy that my father started 32 years ago. He had the vision to create a thriving reserve out of a redundant buffer zone around an explosives factory. Um, so it's a, a story of um, sort of a factory turning into a conservation area and, and rehabilitating what used to be, um, you know, a redundant piece of land. 
Today, Monkwe is home to 53 species of large mammals, including rhino, buffalo, giraffe, leopard, and other rare and endangered species. Over the years, we have managed to um, we have managed to increase the grazing conditions and the quality of water. This has resulted in the creation of a um, thriving ecosystem where all animals can live a free and healthy life in their natural environment. As you'll see on the slide there, we have over two and a half thousand large mammals, many um, rodent species, bat species, over 350 species of birds. Um, so it really is a thriving ecosystem now that we're very proud of. Our team is more like a, a family. Uh, we are a tight-knit group of passionate conservationists. Most of our staff have been here for many years and have greatly contributed to Monkwe's success. Our core business is um, research and education. We decided to take this route as our aim is to inspire young people to follow careers which will help protect our fragile environment. Over 400 students from around the world visit Monkwe every year. They either come as students as part of an ecology-based field course or as Nkombi volunteers. It has been so fulfilling to watch these students become environmentalists, conservationists, and teachers. Many of them have started their own sustainability projects and have become ambassadors of our planet. In, for the past 14 years, our main passion has turned to trying to save the southern white rhino from extinc extinction. Sadly, three rhinos are illegally poached every day in South Africa. They are poached for their horn, which is made up of keratin. It is the most valuable commodity in the world, and that's why so many of them are being killed. People in Southeast Asia believe it as medicinal properties, and more recently, it has become a status symbol due to it being a, a banned product around the world. Rhinos are killed in the most horrific way, and their killings are indiscriminate. So young babies and their mothers are frequently killed. In 2014, we were attacked by rhino, rhino poachers, and we lost five of our precious rhinos. It still haunts us as our rhinos are like our children. I will never get over seeing the horrific way they were killed. Since then, all we have done is try and fight for the survivors. We have trimmed all their horns to reduce the risk of poaching. So obviously they are being killed for their horns. So if you shorten those horns by trimming them, it uh, re greatly reduces the value of the horn and therefore um, the risk to their life becomes about 92% less great. So that is one of the best methods of trying to save these animals. Um, we have also established an anti-poaching team. And, sorry, we have established an anti-poaching team and have um, also acquired anti-poaching canines. Uh, these dogs have been game changers and our team has been incredible in keeping not only the rhino safe, but all the other animals that live at Mankwe. Since 2014, we have had 13 babies uh, born on the reserve um, and every single baby gives us new hope, new strength, and uh, keeps us going on and fighting for these animals. Although my journey with rhinos has been tragic and incredibly sad, it has also been the most meaningful thing I've ever done in my life. My life now has purpose and the most beautiful people have come into my life. We all have a common goal and that will bond us for life. Our goal to try and save the rhinos from extinction. My message to you is that we can do all do something to protect what remains of our beautiful planet. Don't ever think that as one person, you can't make a difference. I was incredibly shy as a child, but since I found my calling, which is to protect the rhino, I've also found my voice. 
It started off with a promise I made to Winnie my rhino after she was killed. My vow was to make her death count for something. Since then, thousands of voices have joined mine. If every one of us decided to make the world we live in a better place, it can be anything in your community, in your direct environment. But if we all chose to fight for something, collectively we could make a positive change. Positivity is contagious and people follow by example. You just need to start leading and they will follow. Let our generation be the generation to hold our head up high. And so we did something before it was too late. Instead of turning the other way and passing on a legacy of destruction. It really is in our hands. I believe that we are at a turning point and it's not too late. And um, if people like um, the people that have presented these videos that I've watched and seen videos from every corner of the world of passionate people like myself actually doing something. I do believe that we can turn this and we can save our planet. And for me, um, the question I have to ask is, what were we doing while the rhino was going extinct? Uh, what were we doing while we were destroying our planet? And um, I'm, I'm very grateful to be invited to this Zoo Lab sustainability um, competition um, because it, it just reassures me that there are people all over the world fighting for what they believe in. And I'm very grateful and um, appreciative to be here. Thank you very much, Lynn. I think um, I'm sure everyone will agree that it, that was actually very moving as well. I myself visiting Manqui, uh, it, it changes you. Um, you actually see a perception of the world very differently. Um, and, and as you said, uh, we can all do things to make a difference. Um, I'm sure we've probably got some questions that people would like to ask. I've got a question I'd like to ask actually as well. Um, obviously with COVID there's a lot of your income to support the reserve and all the needs of the finance needs of the reserve to keep it going comes from volunteers and the trips that come out coming out to you and donations how did you manage through COVID that must have been a very tricky time for you uh, it was a terrifying time um, and we still we still trying to get over the um, the loss of income for the past two and a half years um uh what we did is we we had to really downsize everything and when you're trying to protect uh, rhinos and have your team out there 24 7 and pay fuel costs and trim their horns it was extremely challenging but um what as i said in my presentation we've met the most beautiful people on this journey mm -hmm. and they all got behind us and um you know it didn't matter how small the donation was it helped us keep going and fortunately this year, we have had a few student groups back, um, which has helped us make it to the end of the year. And um, next year is looking uh, much more positive. So we are hoping that we will be able to survive this crisis and, and carry on. Thank you, Lynn. Yeah. Thank you. We have had a question come in on the chat as well. You, and I don't know whether you want to be brave and switch your microphone and camera on and ask a question directly, or if you prefer me to read it out for you. Given a chance to find his unmute button. Not just gonna be able to. Okay, I'll read it out for you. So Ewan is based in Thailand, and he said thank you, Lynn, for a moving presentation. He's a teacher in Bangkok in Southeast Asia. Um, what specifically can we do here to combat poaching? And can you explain a little bit more about the criminal links between South Africa and Southeast Asia for him, Lynn? Thank you. That's an excellent question. Um, there's, there's so much that awareness that needs to go on in South um, Southeast Asia because that's where the demand is. Um, unfortunately, um, the belief is that there's medicinal use in the horn, um, but it's at exactly the same as your hair or your fingernails. It's made up of the same properties. So there's absolutely no medicinal use in a rhino horn. But uh, people in Southeast Asia actually don't realize um, that an animal is brutally killed 
to get the end product. Um, I don't think anyone uh, would allow this to carry on if they'd seen what I see and see how these, these animals suffer. Um, the connection is um, that the syndicates are obviously all from Southeast Asia. Um, and it's a very, it's actually one of the best ways to make a lot of money. So there's some very sinister syndicates involved. Um, and they, they are sort of the ring leaders and the kingpins. And then it sort of filters down right to uh, the foot soldier in South Africa. And these, these people are normally uh, very poor. And um, a lot of them used to fought, fight in the war, so they've got military skills. And, you know, they'll be paid two years salary just um, to guide the poachers to the rhinos, um, shoot them, etc. cetera. Um, and then the, the horn is, is normally out of South Africa within 48 hours. Um, it's ground up into powder and, and um, smuggled out of the country. So the question of um, how this gentleman can help in, in Thailand is um, awareness, just to try and get the message across Firstly, that there is no medicinal use in rhino horn um, and there's no need to kill them and to try and, I mean, I haven't shown the graphic photos that we've got because of the audience today, um, but to try and uh, stress what these animals go through and what custodians of these animals like ourselves go through every day just trying to save them for a belief that just isn't true. Yeah, I can imagine that's really hard. Thank you, Lynn, for answering that question. Uh, we've had another question come in from, or Ewan said, thank you, couldn't work out the unmute. <laughs> but thank you for the really astonishing points. Uh, and Dorian, who is joining us, I think, with her grade five students from Bladens International School in Malmo, Sweden. Do you want to see if you can unmute yourself, Dorian, and ask your question? If not, I can ask it for you. No, okay, I'll ask it for you. So Dorian's question was from her grade five students. So do the rhinos need the horns to protect themselves and what other animals need to be saved? That's an, another very good question. Um, I also believe that we shouldn't trim their horns off um, because they obviously have a horn for a reason. But when our rhinos were killed, um, I knew that that's what I had to do to to save them. So at the same time, we set up um, a scientific study with the Earthwatch Institute and the University of Brighton um, to look at the impacts of dehorning a rhino. And that study is now been running for eight years and we've looked at every single aspect of it. And um, I can confidently say that there's no negative impacts. Um, when we trim the horns, they still have a small horn. So they can still protect um, protect themselves. Um, but even if there were a few calves killed by predators, it's far less than would have been killed by poachers. So therefore, um, we can recommend it as a safe way of trying to save the rhino short term until we can stop the demand. Um, I think the second part of that question was, are there any other animals that need to be saved? Yeah. Um, yeah. Sadly, there are. Uh, pangolin is another animal that is um, going extinct at a rapid rate, also be because of the belief in Southeast Asia that their scales have medicinal use. Um, there's a lot of animals under threat, um, but the ones that we have to focus on now are the ones that... Um, are extremely threatened and um, and trafficked uh, because of medicinal uses. Excellent, thank you, Lynn. And actually, it's quite important to point out today is actually the Remembrance Day for Lost Species internationally, which is a chance for you to explore the stories of extinct and critically endangered species. So one of the reasons it's so great to have you here today, Lynn, is to highlight the plight of the rhinos and talk about the amazing conservation work that you're doing uh, to try and help save this you know, critically endangered species. So we've had another question come through from another group at, at Blardens as well. This is class 5A. Uh, wondered what inspired you to work with saving rhinos to beginning with? Uh, 
yeah, I've always I've always loved uh, rhinos and all animals in general. Um, but my fight for the rhinos uh, started when I came to Mankwe. Um, I think Georgie will agree. Once you've met our rhinos and you've had the privilege of spending time with these beautiful animals, um, you you just want to fight for them. Um, and then having lost some of them because nearly all of them have been born here. So I've seen them since they were babies and they have personalities um, that become very endearing to you. So when you lose one, it's, it's like losing a family member. Um, and I just feel that as, as the world, uh, as our generation, if we, if we can't save something as iconic as the rhino, I mean, they, they kind of left over from the dinosaur days. Um, if we can let something like a rhino slip through our fingers, you know, what chance does a small butterfly have or something that's not as iconic? So, um, yeah, I just, I just don't think this world would ever be the same without rhinos. And, and that's what's inspired me to carry on fighting for them. Absolutely. Thanks, Lynn. And we've had one final question come through from Anthea, one of our other speakers. So Anthea asks, how does removing the horns impact the rhinos? Does that mean eventually they might evolve without horns? Um, it, 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 you know, we'll have to just wait, wait and see. Maybe the horns won't get as long or as big. I mean, that's a long term study um, that we haven't, you know, haven't been able to um, decipher yet. But what we have uh, data on is every time we trim the horn off, we take the measure, measurements of it, the diameter, the length, et cetera. And that doesn't seem to be getting any less. So a lot of people don't realize that horn, a rhino horn grows back every year, about one kg a year. Um, so they continue to grow just like they do if you clip your fingernails. It's exactly the same concept. So they do carry on, on growing. And my hope is that one day we won't have to trim the horns and they can all grow their horns back. I mean, that's the dream. Um, but I learned the hard way. I fought um, the dehorning for about eight years and then they killed our rhinos and then there was no other option. So as I said, the study has shown that there's not, not many or actually no negative impacts they're breeding, they're socializing, just as they would if they had their horns. So for now, that's all we've got. Then I've got another question, actually, if I can. Um, do I'm aware, obviously, you do the dehorning at, at Manqui. Do other reserves um, in the vicinity, do they do the same, do they carry out the same practices? Yeah, so, um, you know, the, the crisis started in 2008 and everyone was very reluctant to do it. Um, and then, you know, as every reserve, including our national park, started getting hit by poachers, um, it's actually become a nationwide practice now. Even Kruger National Park is dehorning their rhinos. Pe Peelandsburg National Park across the road from us have dehorned all of theirs. So one way that may save South Africa's rhinos is to dehorn every single rhino in the country. So that um, you know, South Africa is known that their rhinos are all dehorned. Have we got one more. Thank you, Lynn. Have we got one more question? Oh no, that is from Kirsty to say great questions. Yeah, there've been some fantastic questions. It's it's incredibly interesting. Um, and thank you, Lynn, for all the work that you do. Um, every year we try and send uh, a team out from Zulab to Mankwe to help on the reserve and and help volunteer and carry out some of the procedures uh the data is a running of the reserve and it's it's crucial to help and keep the reserve going to have these visitors um and volunteers um thank you very much for coming along and, and speaking today lynn um i think we'll hand over now and we'll highlight ingrid uh to speak now for us um so if we thank you kirsty <laughs> um so it's now time to hear Ingrid's story and the sustainability issues that she would like to inform us about. So thank you. I'm going to hand over to Ingrid. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Let me try to, oh, sorry. One second. Okay. 
All right. Well, thank you. So me, I would like to, to share my experience in turning human waste and organic waste into compost, um, which I've been doing both in the Gambia and in Haiti, where, where I'm from. So just to introduce a bit where I'm based now since almost two years, the Gambia. So the Gambia is the smallest country in Africa, in mainland Africa. It's, and it is surrounded by, by Senegal. It's like it's inside Senegal with uh, 80 kilometers of coast of, uh, on the Atlantic Ocean. And also, so this country has two seasons, one dry season and one rainy season. And since those past years, the, the draining season has been shorter, becoming shorter. So there is a lot more of drought. And the country has a population of 2.5 million inhabitants. And they are mostly, most of the inhabitants are on, in the coastal area where you have the capital and the, the, the main cities. And in this country, um, agriculture is one of the most important part of the economy. So this is those data that I want to state because when we're talking about the droughts in a small country and we're talking about agriculture, so here comes a lot of challenges for, for this country. And when we look at challenges, so we have gardeners, especially uh, women gardeners working in, in, the, in, in urban area, having urban garden, gardens, but they rely mostly on chemical fertilizers chemical fertilizers that are imported. And this year, the price of chemical fertilizers went from around seven, 700 dollars, which is the local currency, to more than 2,500 dollars. So a lot of farmers cannot afford chemical fertilizers. And even when they were doing using chemical fertilizers, the soils were being depleted because each year they have to use more, the, the, the chemicals are being washed away, going into the soil, and the, the, they have to, do, to use more to have a better yield with their, with their crops. And of course, as a country where all, uh, agriculture is one of the most important part of the economy, there is a lot of organic waste produced in the markets and all the local markets, but the organic waste is mostly going to the dump site. As you can see in one of, of this picture, is the main dump site in the city where all type of waste go. And there is also every year a lot of fires. So everything is being burned, which is um, causing a lot of health hazard for, for the population. And in the Gambia, we know that less than 62% of the population has access to improved sanitation. And it's about 1% of the population that is that is practicing open defecation. So what I'm trying to do in my work is what we say when it's called by how we can we close the loop when we talk about organic waste and human waste, because all our, our waste have value when we are talking about it, what is waste for somebody is, is, uh, is a wealth for another person. So environmentally and economically, waste can be an opportunity. So when we talk about circular economy, in 2015, and UNEP was saying the adoption of a circular economy approach to waste management can bring in another nine to 25 million new jobs and contribute up to 15% reduction in global greenhouse gases emission. So those are things to really consider. So this in this drawing there, it's only considering um, human waste and not the organic waste, but they all can be um, can be transformed together and collected together in a system of this toilet that we see. It's a system of container-based sanitation where you have a collection system and then after you're gonna have a treatment to turn it into compost and it can be reused in the gardens, reused in the farming in the country. So what I've been trying to do in the Gambia here is have a, a very, um, small scale to introduce this type of sanitation with container-based sanitation with a bucket as a container. And so it's a dry toilet, no water, so people can use it and have uh, using sawdust to as a cover material. And after 
uh, using the material. So it's really, so when the bucket is full, it's just to change the bucket and it can be composted and treated offsite, not having people to do it by themselves, but little by little introducing it and not forcing a new idea in the country because some other people or organization are, are doing uh, container-based, not container-based sanitation, but dry sanitation like this, but in a hole and not using the compost directly. Let it sit in a hole and not harvesting the compost, if you can say it like this. So also mixing it with organic waste that can be collected in bins, organic waste from homes, organic waste from the markets, and all being composted in simple, simple compost beans like um, repurpose pallets, and we would monitor the temperature all the time to make sure that we get a high temperature. Like you can see on this thermometer, it's almost 60 degrees Celsius degrees it gets, but it's just the temperature is just the critters working and doing their jobs because this is what they are, that they their job, they're turning this, this organic material into a compost and to fertilize. So if we're talking about human waste, it can take here with the temperature here in the Gambia, it can take um, six to seven months having everything ready. And what I have been doing is really mixing the organic waste with the human waste and making sure we are not causing any, any pollution and that we get the right temperature so we kill all the pathogens. So in the markets, while I was working with Waste State as a project coordinator, so it was a pilot project. So in two different markets, we with vendors. And most of the market vendors are also farmers in the Gambia. So really to, to, to sensitize them on waste segregation, how to properly segregate their waste. And if, although the project was focused on organic waste, but they, they could see that how to segregate all type of waste and knowing the value of other type of waste to do it properly. So very quickly, the sensitization program was going on for uh, once a month the team would go and do the sensitization and people would really get it and get interested in it. And after, in the gardens, the women have been trained on how to, to prepare the compost. And they were very happy about it because as I was saying before, they couldn't afford the chemical fertilizers this year. And some of them have, are working in very big gardens and, um, and the, the city relies on, on those products from their garden or else the Gambia is importing a lot of products from Senegal and other countries. And this is the, the last photo is the, the compost harvested, the result you get like a dark brown compost and good material that can be used in the garden. And yesterday I got a, a phone call from the women gardeners from one of the garden in Bacao saying how happy they are because yesterday they harvested their first compost bean. And for them, it's really uh, happiness and seeing how it can be used because they were taught different method one method where they could get the compost in one month. And yesterday they harvested the compost that was ready after four months. But I must say in the gardens, they are not using human waste. It's only the waste from the markets. But to do this, going like this, we still have issues to overcome in the Gambia because we were, as I was saying, this, all this, this container-based sanitation I am doing, it's really, uh, low scale, it's really pilot. This collection of organic waste from the markets was a pilot project in only two markets and working with two gardens. So we can see that there is a lot of sensitization and awareness needed for people to really understand what is the circular economy, what is the value of, of what we are calling waste and that can be used differently. And here in the Gambia, waste segregation is not something common at all. And it's not only waste segregation, there is also lack of beans everywhere. So it's not easy for people to find the beans to put things. And if they are not sensitized and they are not aware, when they are seg segregated beans, they don't know exactly and which bean to put what. So those are things that we need to go forward with and go further with. Circular economy is quite new in the Gambia when we talk about circular economy. Wasted has a circular economy project that they started in January this year. It's gonna be an 18 month project. Um, a lot of youth are part of the circular economy network. This network is more focused on organic waste, tires and plastic. 
which are the main, let's say, waste items that are causing more most problem in the Gambia. So we are seeing some awareness coming, but we still need a lot more work to do around this. And especially when we are talking about human waste, because the Gambia is mostly a Muslim country, and there is this fear of, when we talk about human waste, there is this fear of human waste we're gonna turn into compost. So this is why people really need to see how it works, how those toilets works. And although there is, a, there is open defecation in the country, although the toilets, most of the toilets people are using are not quite adequate and that they don't, they don't stop the pollution of the environment, but there is this fear of human waste when you talk about poop, when we talk about pee, people are just, oh no, we're not supposed to, to touch this. We're not supposed to be working with this. I always get people telling me, no, the Gambia is not ready for this type of toilet. The Gambia is not ready for this type of compost. But for me, it is really a passion. And this is really something I want to continue doing and go forward with it. I have worked in that and other other African countries also in, in West Africa were really slowly, little by little, we did introduce this. And at some point when people were seeing the value of the compost, when they were using it and seeing that the end product, the compost they get has nothing to see with what was in the toilet, dropped in the toilet at first. So people really get into it and get to seeing, okay, this is valuable. And I think right now in the Gambia, it's really a moment because of this issue with the price of, of chemical fertilizer. This is a right moment to introduce this. And the communities and the government are really aware uh, of the sanitation and environmental issues they are, they are facing. So it's a moment to introduce this little by little. Also, people who have septic tanks or suck away toilets, when the trucks come and empty those toilets, it goes to, a, they have only one sewage plant facility for the entire country. And this sewage plant is, is located very near the mangrove and the sea. So at the end, after staying in the stabilization ponds, the liquid part is going back to, to the environment which could be used differently because we need that for our own consumption and our own production. So this is basically why, what I really wanted to share today with you guys. And I think that as uh, Lean was saying, and I, and I think as everybody could say, together we can do a lot of things. Those are little, little steps that we can do towards sustainability and protecting our environment. So thank you everybody. Thank you very much, Ingrid. That was fascinating, actually, an ingenious idea um, that uh, when we talk about circular economy, it's, it symbolizes things in nature, doesn't it? Our carbon cycle, our water cycle, where everything is, is a cyclic, which is a cyclic uh, system, which means that everything is in balance. And that's exactly what this, um, this uh, depicts. Um, have we got any questions from anybody? at all about Ingrid's uh, presentation. Okay, we have a question here from Ewan. Uh, Ewan, Ewan, did you want to unmute? I think Ewan was before and... No, okay. Uh, so he's saying, hi Ingrid, fascinating stuff. How long do you have to wait before it is safe to use? Well, thank you for the question. I believe UN is talking about the, the human waste. So it, the, the land depends on where you're living, the temperature we're living. Like I would say in countries like if you're living in Europe where you have the cold, it would take, it's safe to wait for at least nine months for it to be ready. Once your, once your bean is full. In a country like the Gambia, um, what I would is that after six months the compost is ready you get you get to the the temperature is, is back to the ambient temperature and you, you are sure that we kill the pathogens same thing in Haiti but it was a bit different because in Haiti we we, we are not mixing with waste with other type of organic waste and the toilets that we are using the the urine is not mixed in it so it's, it's a different composition so our compost is ready in eight months where we get to the right temperature and we check in the lab and we have no pathogens and so it's absolutely safe to be used. 
Thank you, Ingrid. Do we have any more questions for um, regarding Ingrid's presentation at all? I've got, I've got a question I'd like to ask. Okay, thank you, Kirsty. Uh, Ingrid, so do you notice any difference in the attitudes and the receptiveness between the younger generations and the older generations that you work with? Do you see any differences between sort of the generations? Um, well, I wouldn't say that much here. What I, the difference I can see is that people who are directly involved in farming, like the gardeners, they are really eager to learn about the compost and they are really eager to try it. But people who are not directly farmers, they are not that much into it. Because last week, there was a two, two days of a job fair and I was doing a training on composting. And I would see that the youth, it was mostly for young people. They were not interested in the compost training. They were more interested in, in entrepreneurship and training and other things like that. But the women gardeners who were there, yes, they absolutely wanted to learn this. So I would say this is the difference I, I see here. Um, but, mm, uh, well, yeah, that's what I can say. I, I don't know exactly what um, are the difference regarding, regarding this towards this yeah interesting that those Thanks. that are most most potentially impacted and finding the most benefits are those that are most keen to get involved and try and those that perhaps are that step further away are a little bit more reluctant to to learn more about it because it doesn't directly impact them i think we probably see that with quite a lot of sustainability challenges very yeah. much so yeah uh, thank you. We've also got another question from Dorian at uh, Bladens International the, so from a student. Uh, does animal waste have the same effect as human waste? Well, um, I would say yes. You can do, when you're doing compost, you can use animal waste, but avoiding like waste from dogs, for example, because their digestive system is so different and they are eating so much different things that it will be harder to kill the pathogens that can be in their, in their poop. But animal waste as being used and composted with different other, other organic waste can be used and have a good, a good compost also. And the thing is the type, the right balance you're gonna get, the, comp the type of compost you're gonna be using, if you're using more woody material and things like this, it will depend in the end what you're gonna be using it for. Like for example, if you're going growing trees, they need more woody material. If you're gonna be growing the more vegetables, it's gonna be a mix, a compost with more, um, let's say a bit more, less woody material in it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Ingrid. Any more final questions? Any questions from our other speakers at all? No, okay. Thank you ever so much, Ingrid, for joining us today and speaking to us about uh, your sustainability issues in Gambia. Uh, we're now going to hand over to Anthea. Uh, see if I can find Anthea to spotlight. Oh, thank you, Kesty. Kesty's on it already. There we go. Uh, welcome, Anthea. Thank you, Georgie. Can you hear me properly? We can. Okay, perfect. Thank you. My name is Anthea, as uh, George mentioned. I'm an environmental engineering graduate from Democritus. And I'm going to speak to you today about my thesis uh, um, titled Coastal Erosion Along the Shoreline of Seychelles and Mitigation Using Artificial Coral Reef. The coastal zones, as we know, are the most dynamic environment in the world. It's constantly changing under the effects of different variables. And one of those variables are human and their uh, activities in the coastal areas. Over the years, human interference with the coastal areas have caused a severe degradation in the shoreline worldwide. The most vulnerable areas to coastal erosion are the small island states like Seychelles. Seychelles is an archipelago in the west of Indian Ocean with around 115 islands with the main island Mahi. The Seychelles islands are divided into two groups, the um, inner islands and the outer islands in relation to Mahi, the distance to Mahi and their uh, characteristics. The inner islands are uh, rather high with steep mountains and rugged, uh, steep rugged mountains and narrow coastal plains, while the outer islands are rather flat 
made of uh, senkes and uh, dead uh, reefs or even atolls. The coastline, coastline of Seychelles are around 491 kilometers long, and 90% of the population and all the economic activities are located on the narrow coastal plains at an elevation of 200 meters above sea level. The main economic activities in Seychelles are tourism and uh, fisheries. There are four main causes of coastal erosion. This is reduction in sediment supply. Uh, sediments usually comes from glaciers. During the glaciers er era, sediments were released along when uh, ice were melted and also from uh, rivers. Communion is the process where uh, larger uh, particles are uh, turned into uh, smaller particles due to different processes. And in coastal areas, uh, sediments that are finer are more prone to being washed away with the wave action. Submergence is uh, related to relative sea level rise. And uh, as the sea level rise, there are less uh, land available to be used. And as mentioned before, human intrusion, when uh, uh, the human population moved to coastal areas, there were a need to create space. And this uh, need uh, of this, to create the space, it required more land and habitat to be destroyed. And in the process, many areas, many habitats like uh, wetlands and coral reefs, sand dunes were also destroyed. And these were natural barriers to protect shorelines against the coastal, the wave action, hence coastal erosion. In terms of Seychelles, there are two main uh, problems uh, in relation to climate change that uh, also cause coastal erosion. Those are the sea level rise and storm surges. For Seychelles, an increase of the slight uh, increase in the sea level rise, will it means that many land will be lost and infrastructures as uh, all of the infrastructures are located on the shoreline. And uh, any, um, the IPCC mentioned that there will be an increase of uh, one meter in the future and all, almost all the coastline will be affected by this. In regards to storms, as mentioned before, the Seychelles are divided into two groups, the outer islands where they receive the storms. However, the inner islands that are outside of the intertropical zones, which mean uh, that they don't receive that much storms. Since the IPCC projected that there will be an increase in storm frequency, this also means that uh, um, storms will most likely reach the inner islands as well in the future. My study covered uh, Mahe and uh, where the um, accretion and uh, erosion rate were estimated and uh, a grain cyber analysis to analyze the sediments on the shore and to determine if they are on the finer spectrum or the core spectrum. Also, there was a wave uh, uh, analysis where I used the uh, data from the wind and um, uh, wave hint casting to uh, determine the wave heights. And uh, also a coastal vulnerability analysis using the coastal vulnerability index. The study determined that the uh, islands uh, the islands are exposed to waves originating from deep waters. The longer di the distance and the higher the wave height reaching the shore. Um, there are other factors such as river discharge that also alters the coastline and coastal process processes as uh, sediment transport uh, also leads to degradation in shoreline. The coastal vulnerability index uh, was uh, based on the three uh, variables, those were uh, the coastal characteristics, the um, socioeconomic activities, and the coastal forcings. The coastal characteristics, most of the beaches in Seychelles are made of uh, sands, which means that they are, were more prone to be removed by wave actions and easier to be transported along the shore. In terms of socioeconomic activities, I'm, as mentioned, since Seychelles is a small island state, most of the with the uh, ocean and the coastal areas, which was ranked higher on the 
um, uh, ranking index. And in terms of uh, wave heights, uh, the higher the distance on the from that the wave comes from, the higher where the wave heights and areas with high wave heights, they had the most uh, coastal erosion. And uh, since Seychelles is a small island, there were only there's only one uh, station that records the sea level rise and the the mean tide, which means that uh, there is there was a slight inaccuracy in the these measurements the ranking, but however most of the uh, areas studied they showed that uh, they were high vulner highly vulnerable to coastal erosion. In Seychelles, there has been uh, some measures taken to address coastal erosion. It involves hard engineering techniques such as groins and uh, um, sea walls, and also timber piling. And soft engineering techniques included uh, sand dunes, as shown in the picture on the left bottom. Recently, there has been some ecosystem-based adaptation such as uh, restoration uh, of uh, wetlands, as well as coral reefs. As mentioned, my study uh, focused on artificial coral reefs, and it was shown that artificial coral reefs can protect the shoreline. Natural uh, coral reefs are natural barriers. However, the, um, the corals are an organism that are uh, very sensitive to any changes such as uh, sea temperature. An increase in sea temperature will damage corals and in the event of uh, El Nino in 1995, most of the corals in Seychelles were also damaged and uh, the, they were, it left uh, the uh, coastlines of Seychelles to be vulnerable to all, all the wave actions. However, uh, the Coral as an organism, it takes a long time for them to grow, and it takes a long time to it uh, to have the protection that it used to have. Therefore, it's proposed to have uh, an artificial coral reefs that will also provide the wave attenuation that a normal natural coral reef will bring, and also it can be used to uh, have uh, as a base for reef restoration, which also means that there will be um uh, the natural uh, uh, activities going on and increase the biodiversity and more fishes around uh, the artificial coral reef it also means that the normal livelihood that Seychelles depends on such as uh, fisheries and uh, tourism in terms of diving uh, or uh, sea activities can also occur in the presence of an artificial coral reef the study also showed that uh, artificial reef can be used as a, a preventive measure to reduce the wave uh, height and as a mitigation to increase uh, um, uh, increase uh, the sediments along the shore. Uh, that means promotes accretion instead of erosion without adversely affecting uh, the other areas next to the reef, the structure. To conclude, uh, we found that uh, coral uh, coastal erosion is occurring along the shorelines of Seychelles at different rates, and factors such as intense wave action and climate change exacerbate the impact of coastal erosion. The measures taken so far has helped the situation. However, there are room for improve improvement. More accurate data will significantly improve the quality of mitigation and adaptation measures. An artificial reef is a viable option for coastal management as it can uh, use as a mitigation measure and a prevention measure for coastal erosion. Thank you for listening. Any questions? Fantastic, thank you, Anthea. That was really interesting. So over to our audience, if you've got any questions that you want to ask Anthea, you're welcome to switch your microphones on or you can type them in the chat and I can pass them to her. I've got a question for you, Anthea. Why did you decide that you were going to focus on this for your thesis and your career? That's a big decision to make. Why, why was this issue so important to you? Um, when I grew up, I used to, I grew up by the sea in, in Beauvalon on the coast in Seychelles, on Mahi, the main island. 
and uh, I joined the club with uh, that form part of the marine and learn about the biodiversity, the marine science and everything about it. And then uh, I decided that uh, um, marine science was not for me and I wanted to be more practical. And uh, when I saw the opportunity to have, uh, to, well, apply my, uh, my degree, my environmental engineering site, the um, abilities to help the ocean and protect the coast and protect what I grew up with. And I took this opportunity and decided that it would be excellent. And Seychelles is uh, um, mostly reliant on uh, the coastal areas. I thought it would be a, a good uh, topic for my thesis. Brilliant, thank you. We've had a couple of questions come in for you, Anthea. So Ewan from Thailand asks you, uh, says, very interesting, are there many coral reef restoration projects in the Seychelles? And can you explain a bit more how, uh, how an artificial reef is created? Okay. Um, in Seychelles, there are quite a few uh, sites of, uh, that they are doing coastal restorations at the moment. Artificial reefs, uh, they can be in different forms. It can, it is essentially a type of breakwater. It can be a hard structure that is long, or it can be little balls uh, that has holes in them. And uh, you can easily attach the, the, uh, the reefs, the uh, nurture reefs that are used to, uh, um, for the coastal, the, the coral reef uh, restoration. And uh, pretty much that's it. And uh, as the it, their, uh, the structure, when it's there, it uh, decreases the depth of the water. That means that it decreases the height, the wave height. And uh, the lower the wave height, the less energy that is transferred to the, to the reef, to the beach, to the shore. And it means that the uh, less sand is taken away from the shore as well as uh, it, the water draws back, it's caught in the structure and prevents it from going away and lost to the deeper sea. Great, thank you. And we've got a couple of questions from our students now. So one of the students from 5A class at Bladens wonders if any of the smaller islands ever flood over and how that might affect your work. In Seychelles, uh, my study showed that there has been erosion. This means that the there are some mergents occurring in Seychelles at the moment. And uh, I'm not aware if we have lost some of our islands. It might happen in the outer islands because we have many islands that are uninhabited. It might occur that uh, smaller, flatter islands have been lost to uh, to a wave of a topping or completely lost. Amazing. I know that um, the Maldives is another small island state that's having particular issues because of sea level rise and their government are in talks to find out what the plan is going to be in future for potentially having to evacuate people living from islands because so many of the islands are so low lying and the increasing sea levels are potentially going to be displacing people from their homes. So they may have to evacuate whole populations of some of the islands. So this is a really key issue for many of these sort of small low-lying island states that perhaps we don't hear about so often, but are really facing the, the brunt of climate change and rising sea levels, aren't they, Anthea? Exactly. Um, there are many management, coastal management strategies available. However, as there are limited space on small islands, it's difficult to apply most of the strategies as uh, relocation, as you mentioned, or uh, retreat as there's no space. And what can we do? It's either adaptation or uh, protection, hard protection or soft protection techniques. And we've got another student question. This is from uh, Ananya Verma who says, is it true that if plankton growth is supported, more carbon dioxide will be absorbed by the plankton in the oceans? Actually, uh, the ocean is one of the uh, biggest uh, carbon uh, absorber in the world. So definitely phytoplankton, uh, um, even coral reefs, as they are uh, photogenic organisms, they will help uh, reduce the carbon emission uh, in the atmosphere. Absolutely, yeah. As much as I advocate for rainforests, as you can see working in one, <laughs> uh, yeah, 
oceans and carbon carbon storage are really go hand in hand. So things like the seagrass beds that you find, coral reefs, the mangrove forests that Ingrid mentioned earlier on are all really important and if not more efficient at storing carbon than the more famous rainforests that we hear so much about. So it's equally important that our ocean habitats and those marine and coastal habitats are protected as well for their carbon storage, for their ecosystem services, for their coastal protection, uh, for their sort of nursing of the, the fish industries as well. Lots of really important habitats and environments there. Fantastic. Any other questions for Anthea? Georgie, have you got anything you wanted to ask, Anthea? Yeah, I will ask a, ask a question, if that's OK, Anthea. I was just going to ask the population of the island. Uh, is everyone um, sort of pro making these adaptations? They're, they're, what's the general feel from sort of all age ranges and the general feel of consensus of everybody's viewpoint on the island? Seychelles, we are lucky that uh, almost everyone is involved and everyone is aware. So awareness is not a problem in Seychelles. Um, from the younger generation, they know about uh, the issues, the threats that we are facing today. And uh, since we are a really small population of uh, less than 100,000, um, we can easily influence the political, the government to um, uh, be interested in our future as young people. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit more easier as a community, we are together in this fight. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Anthea. Um, that was a, all three very fascinating presentations. Thanks to all our speakers today and, and for spending the time to come along and get involved in our sustainability challenge. Um, we need to remind ourselves um, why we set the challenge uh, to our audience and to recognize that sustainability is a global issue. Um, however, trying to tackle these problems on a global scale can be difficult. Impacts of these issues are often on a local level and effective solutions are often locally focused as well. Uh, as mentioned earlier, our aim was to empower young people to connect with local sustainability challenges and recognize that they can be part of the solution. Our speakers today have highlighted raw real life sustainability issues which threaten species welfare and livelihoods the threat of climate change and unsustainable practices magnify these issues and cause concern for the future and our younger generations today we will be viewing videos created by students that show an understanding of the impacts of unsustainable methods and the need to educate and adapt quickly to the changing world before we watch our top 10 videos however we have 14 very important honourable mentions that we felt could not uh, just be passed by. Uh, these students showed great passion, enthusiasm, creativity and understanding of our fast paced evolving world. And I'm now going to hand over to Kirsty, who will read out the names and locations of these inspiring students for our honourable mentions. Wonderful. Let me just make that full screen so that everyone can see. So yeah, as Georgie mentioned, we had a lot of amazing entries this year. Unfortunately, couldn't all be winners, but the judges felt that there were certain entries that definitely rec required additional recognition. So congratulations to our honourable mentions. So in the primary category, that was uh, from Adia Aravind Shankar from India, Hu Min from the Olympia schools in Vietnam. We had an amazing group entry from Monteverde Friends School in Costa Rica, which was our first entry from Costa Rica ever. So congratulations to them. We had an amazing slam poem from Henriette Humbert from Bladins International School Marmo, who I'm hoping is with us on the call with her class. So congratulations to you, Henriette, and also to Avantika and Arjun Dutt from International School Seychelles, who sent in a brother and sister entry. For our secondary schools, we had a few more amazing entries that we felt deserved additional recognition. So Ananya Verma, who's with us today, welcome Ananya, from Springdale's school in India, created an amazing rap, which she shared with us on air pollution. We had an entry from Tanish Agarwal from the Sindhya school in India as well. Uh, Hajitu's Sekhar's in entry from My Farm in Gambia, we felt deserved special recognition, addressing some of the problems that uh, Ingrid had spoken about with plastic pollution and also waste. We had some great team entries as well. So Cesara, Andre, Livia, Maria and Stefan from Liku Valam School in Romania had a great entry on the geography section. We also had a fantastic entry from Queen's College in Guyana from Zayanara, Shakan, Shoshana, Samira, Gabriella, Teresa, Divine and Kyla as well. I'm hoping I'm getting my name pronunciation correct. Apologies if not, <laughs> testing my language abilities. 
Uh, we also had a great team entry looking at the port infrastructure and flooding in Turkey from Metu DF School in Mersin, that was Bursa, Berun, Ella and Ada. Uh, and finally, we had entries from the junior secondary school Jabi number no. one in Nigeria, Ulink College of Shanghai, China, and also the Foundation Dar Sif Mad from Morocco sent amazing group entries through. So thank you to all of you for being part of our competition, not quite making it to finalists, but definitely deserving the honorable mention recognition from our judges. So congratulations to all of our honorable mentions. Those videos are also gonna be made available on social media for you to see as well. Um, and we'll learn a little bit more about that later on how you can watch our honorable mention videos and entries. Thank you very much, Kirsty. Um, before we view our top finalists, so we've got our very shortly, we're going to have our top videos countdown to find out our winners today. But before we do that, um, we're going to, going to go to our judges and just ask them to share a few thoughts on the feedback, feed, three thoughts and feedback on the entries that they have seen, uh, they've sat and watched, and and what particular videos stand out to them. So if it's okay, I'd like to hand over to Lynn if she just has. Uh, a, a few words to say. Thank you, Lynn. Oh, if you could unmute for us, Lynn. Can you hear me now? Thank you. Yeah, it was uh, very refreshing to see all the projects are going around the world. Um, you know, so diverse um, of different scales. Uh, you know, just small ones that affected the direct community, much bigger ones, ones that were sort of fighting for change in policy. Um, but just to see the amount of passion in, in the youth and the awareness, uh, it seems to be, you know, increasing from when I was that age and, and so many youngsters taking sustainability very seriously um, and, and I was so encouraged by that. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Lynn. I have to absolutely agree with you on that. I was uh, totally bowled over with a lot of our entries, to be honest, and I'll speak about that in a moment. Uh, I'm going to go over to Ingrid. If Ingrid, if you don't mind just saying a few words for us as well. Yes, thank you. Me too. I was very impressed by all the videos, all the creativity in, in each video. You could see a creativity and like Lynn was saying, the, the awareness, seeing all those students um, really taking into observing the environment and taking into consideration a problem and wanting to highlight it and find a solution or identify the solution that their their country or their community is already is already putting in place now i really found it very very interesting and very encouraging to see really the youth like this taking um taking a step forward towards sustainability and toward protecting and helping their environment and finding solutions, not only for their communities, but also proposing solutions for other parts of the world that can face the same, the same issues. Really, thank you. Thank you, Ingrid. Uh, as I said, uh, I've sat and watched these videos along with our other judges, and I've got to agree, I was in very inspired by especially our younger generation, especially some of the primary entries and the understanding of human activities and the impacts that that has, and then researching solutions of in solutions that might already be out there or, or solutions that they may not be aware of and they've had to go go out and do their own research on. Uh, it shows great knowledge and understanding of the subject of sustainability. The presentations were also of a very high standard as well uh, and, and a diverse range of topics too. So uh, a great big well done to everyone. Uh, we now need to view our top 10 videos um, that were shortlisted by judges and then voted by the public. So if I, I can hand over, Kirsty, if you are, are ready, I'll do our fifth place for primary. Oh, are you okay, um, Kirsty? Yeah, I'm just making sure I've got the sound. Okay, so we've got our fifth place for primary, uh, which is by Mamundi Gajadira from Sri Lanka, Living in a Wetland. Living in a Wetland. Kaduela, a small village in the suburbs of Colombo, Sri Lanka, is where my family has lived for a few generations now. The historical city, cited in many folklore, is a significantly large wetland. Hi, I am Mumdi Gatira, and I want to show you the challenges faced by my beautiful hometown. A wetland is a land 
which has many swamps and marshes. It is generally wet. It has lots of water bodies. Because of these features, it has a delicate unique ecosystem. Marshes and swamps with their green unique ecosystems is a sight to see in the mornings. This wetland has helped the village to keep away the floods in the heavy months. Wetlands serve to store water, preventing floods, purify water, maintain biodiversity, preserve groundwater. These lands, which fulfilled their duties for centuries, have been challenged over the last three decades by unplanned actions of us, unplanned constructions, cutting down trees, contamination with chemicals and toxic products, plastic pollution and clogging, a compromising for wetlands. Whatever we do to the nature returns back harder. Disappearing wetlands result in flooding, loss of biodiversity, My hometown had been badly affected by floods during the past few years, destroying property and lives. Ponds which absorb rainwater has become so small that even a light rain would result in floods. It has become an urgent matter to find a solution to the floods. From what I have worked out, my plan is 1. Conservation by law 2. Their plant constructions 3. Sustainable usage 4. Community-based cleaning projects Five, school level awareness programs, conservation by law. I suggest to identify significant wetlands in my area and to conserve them by law. Wetland constructions. I suggest any further construction done in the area should be well planned with the proper permission from authorities. This was not further damage. Sustainable usage. Usage of existing wetlands should be well planned and sustainable. Authorities should make necessary laws and most importantly, the community should support. Community-based cleaning projects. The most important stakeholder in this is the local community. So I suggest to initiate community-based cleaning programs to keep your own wetlands alive. School level awareness programs. Education begins from school. Involving local school kids in conservation of their own wetlands is another plan I came up with. This will take the message home too. Variety of awareness programs and active involvement in keeping wetlands safe can be initiated at school level. We are part of the nature. We cannot be separated from it. Whatever we do to the nature returns back hard. So it is time for us to act more responsible. Thank you and a big well done to Mamundi for that fantastic video uh, presentation. So we're now going to move on to our fifth place for secondary. Uh, and this is from Shreya Kaushik from India. And the title of the video is an eco-friendly floating membrane. When I cross that road near school, I see a pond, greenish in color because of eutrophication, a little blackish because of sewage water discharge and multicolored because of several solid waste. Exact 10 years from now, when I was a small 4-year child, I used to see beautiful and clean water flowing in the pond. Seeing this pond, I've always wondered if I could do something to restore the beauty. Hey everyone, my name is Shreya Kaushik and I am a high school student, innovator and STEM enthusiast. I am really passionate about nanotechnology and fusion energy and how they can apply it to solve real world problems. Now let's continue the story. To find an informed approach, I took River Yamuna as my sample area of research. The River Yamuna is 1,376 km river and one of the most polluted rivers in India. The river gets heavily polluted due to discharged sewage, untreated industrial waste and domestic waste with high levels of heavy metals and nutrients. According to the Central Pollution Control Bureau, nearly 359 industrial units directly and indirectly and 42 directly pollute the river Yamuna. But the root cause lies in the submergence of Nazavgar drain which carries wastewater loads from domestic agriculture and industrial sector. Nazavgar adds up to 60% of the total waste and 81.36 tons of BOD per day to River Yamuna. But is there any sustainable solution? The answer is yes. The answer is an eco-friendly floating membrane, which is a combination of constructed floating wetland and nanocellulose based membrane. Now let's understand these. Floating wetlands are artificial wetlands that work on the principle of bioremediation where a particular type of aquatic plants are introduced, are grown on the biometrics and their roots protruding help remove the contaminants from the water, as you can see in the image. Whereas nanocellulose refers to nanostructured cellulose 
and works on the principle of membrane and nanotechnology. The membrane consists of four layers, microfiltration, ultrafiltration, and nanofiltration, and reverse osmosis, which are arranged in hierarchical level, and the small pores present in them helps to filter out the contaminant. Now, when you add these two solutions, you get an eco-friendly floating membrane which consists of again the same materials, the selected aquatic plants at the upper part, which are inserted in the nanocellus membrane in the lower part. In this solution, we have totally removed the biometrics, which was made up of plastic or forms. The solution has the ability to remove dyes, pesticides, microbes and heavy metals and contaminants. Now, how is it different? different because it is sustainable, has practicability of replication and is cost effective. Lastly, I would just say there is no planet B, so let's take care of the earth. Thank you. I cross that road near school, I see a pond. Ganesh fabulous. Thank you to Shreya. Shreya, a, a fabulous video there uh, on eco-friendly floating membrane. Okay, so we're our countdown now. We are going into our fourth place at primary. And our fourth place primary goes to Shi Ruo Chen from Indonesia. And the title of this video is Recycle Plastic Bottles. Hello everyone, my name is Daniel. I am from Sagrata Putra and I am in QIP 3B. And I am eight years old. Hey, what are you thinking? What are you doing? You should recycle that. Yes, I want to recycle it. But I don't know how to recycle this plastic bottle. Okay, let's start recycling. First, we need to prepare a bottle and some tape, scissors, a knife and a colorful drawing. Once this dry, we can start. If you don't know how to use scissors, ask a dot for help. Also, a dot also can help you in this project. Thank you for paying attention, friend. Look guys, I'm done. This is a pencil holder. It is easy to make. First, cut the top of the plastic bottle. Then, Draw on a piece of paper and leave a space to see inside the pencil holder. Everyone, we also make plastics. Plastics are for drinking bottles like this. But do not throw them away. We can recycle them. If you don't want to recycle them just like me making this pencil holder, you can watch YouTube videos to you how to make about plastic bottles recycling. Thank you guys. Bye bye. Ljubljana, capital city of Slovenia. Covering Fabulous. Well done to she. I love the fact that you were playing two roles there, and I love the fact you were concerned about health and safety with the scissors as well. That made me smile. Uh, okay, so our fourth place for secondary goes to Emma Asby and Zala Tusek from Slovenia. And the title of this video is From Grey to Green. Ljubljana, capital city of Slovenia, covering an area of 275 square kilometers and has 292,988 inhabitants who make up for 13.9% of population of Slovenia. But with that comes troubles, such as noise pollution, water pollution, light pollution, plastic pollution, soil pollution, air pollution caused by carbon footprint, floods caused by drying of Ljubljansko Barje, and drastic temperature changes. Hello, I'm Imaj Be, and here is the breaking news. A large climate change has appeared in Ljubljana, once a green city, now turning grey. It can happen anywhere, even in your city, so be careful. 
We are the main source of it. It's only a matter of time before a catastrophic disaster glare floods, dooms us, and there's no time left. But there's still time. Ljubljana has taken in enormous projects for the environment, such as getting electric powered aka environmental friendly vehicles as a free public transport. Zala, back to you. Thank you, Emma. As you can see, you can rent electric scooters and bikes, so there's less carbon footprint and less noise. According to data from the European European Environment Agency, EEA for short, from 2018, Ljubljana is the third greenest city in Europe. Asnima. Yeah. If we put in enough effort, we can truly save the world. Fantastic news report there from Emma and Zala showing how uh, we really need a collaborative effort to uh, make changes on this planet. Uh, Anthea, would you like to introduce our next uh, videos? Or would you like me to continue? I'll continue. I'm not sure if Anthea's there. I'll continue. Okay, so in third place, at primary, we have v uh, Vedant Menon from the United Kingdom. Uh, video is entitled My Local Sustainability Challenge Invasive Species. Hello, my name's Rim. I recently moved to the city of Manchester in UK. And there's this one issue that's bothering me and my neighbourhood too. Invasive species. You may ask what are invasive species? Invasive species are those animals and plants who have been brought from different lands and they compete with the native animals and plants and destroy or take over their brand new environment. The main invasive plants in my city are Japanese knotweed, giant hogweed and the Himalayan balsam. The giant hogweed is also notorious for causing burns in children. It is interesting to note that most of these plants were brought in to the British Islands by us humans in the past in the name of discovery and propagation. The results which are of course devastating. One must not plant non-natives in the wild or anywhere. If you find invasive non-natives in your land, immediately report to a responsible adult and remove them appropriately. Non-native invasive plants can be removed by using approved natural herbicides pulling them out and leaving them to dry up, disposing them off-site through a registered waste carrier. One must not compose them as they can be quite persistent. Remember, non-native species do not support our local biodiversities. 
it may be a bigger problem to us than it may seem to us. Let us help create a better tomorrow, not just for us humans, but for all animals, plants, butterflies and bees who co-inhabit the earth with us. Thank you. Okay, well done to Vedant for identifying the issues that uh, the impacts of invasive species. We're now going to move on to our third place for secondary, and that goes to Yun Kim from Thailand, uh, the Korean International School of Bangkok. And the, the video is entitled, What do we do with expired medicine? Hello, I'm Ian Kim, a Korea student living and studying in Thailand. I visit my home country, Korea, every school holiday. The recent pandemic got me thinking about medicine. What is the cell life of medicine? What do I do with it once they expire? Do I just throw it away in the trash? Well, let's think about it. Support I just throw in the trash. My expired medicine probably end up in the garbage dump. Although this waste become a problem as it decomposes. If it flows in the river and seas, it disrupts the ecosystem, pollute drinking water and damage aquatic life. For example, in July 2020, researcher at the Gwangju Institute of Science and Technology in Korea discovered the substance gabapentin, the main ingredient in the treatment of epilepsy in the Nakdongang River. The researcher pointed out that the river is not only affected by pollution coming from sewage, but also from the various chemicals that make up the medicine we throw away. So then, how do these waste like medicine need to be probably disposed of? Because of this study, a plan is currently being carried out in Korea with the purpose of making people aware of the need to return unwanted or expired medicine to pharmacies or health center. But not everyone is familiar with this. I wasn't aware of it until very recently. And the reason is that there are no clear signs promoting this campaign and the bin used to collect all this unwanted medicine are not visible enough even inside pharmacies. So while the existing plan is a great idea, I feel that it needs more visibility in the form of clearly designed posters inside pharmacies and hospital waiting room as well as school and other educational institution. In addition, clearly leveled bins should be moved to more prominent location inside pharmacies and hospitals. I'm sure many families made supply of various medicine during the pandemic, and some of it will most probably expire somewhere in drawer. Therefore, I feel people need to know how to dispose of medicine the right way. This simple thing, properly disposing of unwanted medicine, can reduce some of the damage human activities can cause in the environment and at this point in time. Every little thing matter for our planet. Uh, well done to Yun Kim. That was interesting to have a, a topic highlighted that is often not in the forefront of our minds as well. Uh, Ingrid, would you like to introduce the next video? Yes, of course. Yeah, thank you very much. So yes, I would like to introduce the videos for the second place. For primary school, we have um, St. Andrews International School Eco Beast Group from Thailand with a video entitled Our Local Sustainability Challenge. Let's check this room. There's no one inside. 
Okay, that's uh, that was a great video from the Eco Beast Group, and uh, uh, great to see them all working together there for for that video. Uh, thank you, Ingrid. Yes, that was a great video. So for the secondary school, we have the Colegio Didascalio Nuestra Señora de la Esperanza from Colombia, and with a video entitled "Vegetable Garden of Hope." Consideramos que nuestro proyecto Huerta de la Esperanza puede beneficiar a una población estudiantil que afronta todo tipo de problemáticas sociales. Que merece soñar, crear, aprender, pero sobre todo crear. Estamos convencidos que nuestro proyecto puede mejorar las condiciones de vida de las familias y que aportará a los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible o de hambre cero, salud y bienestar, educación de calidad, producción y consumo responsable. Nuestro proyecto se denomina Huertas de la Esperanza. Iniciativa liderada por los estudiantes de la institución Díaz Caldio Nuestra Señora de la Esperanza. Su propósito es establecer un espacio verde. Que a futuro aporte a la seguridad alimentaria de los estudiantes. Y al cuidado del medio ambiente. Es innovador ya que su aplicación y utilización es un recurso didáctico en los procesos de enseñanza. Y considerado por los expertos como una alternativa eficaz. Que orienta, imparte y genera conocimientos hacia los estudiantes. Nuestra huerta de la esperanza será un recurso pedagógico. Que contribuyan al desarrollo de sus competencias básicas. Trabajo en equipo entre estudiantes, profesores y directivos. Plan de capacitación e implementación de estas. Establecimiento de la huerta. Producción de frutas y verduras de buena calidad. Cambiar los hábitos alimenticios. Conocimiento y cuidado de los ciclos naturales de la tierra. Fomento del respeto hacia el medio ambiente y los recursos naturales. Estamos seguros de que con la implementación de este proyecto se mejorará de manera armónica la calidad de vida de los estudiantes y sus familias. Siendo esta también un ejercicio de participación ciudadana. Las huertas no solo son seguridad alimentaria. También representa la posibilidad de que muchas familias produzcan alimentos complementarios, como lo son las verduras, hortalizas, que ampliarán la canasta básica familiar. La implementación de proyectos se busca brindar a los estudiantes y sus familias capacitación en la hacienda, pero sobre todo en la paciencia, conciencia y cuidado de la cosecha. Buscamos aportar a largo plazo desde el agua a la disminución de la disminución de uno de nuestros principales problemas que afectan a nuestra comunidad. Queremos trabajar por un entorno que cumpla con lo básico en salud y alimentación. Sabemos que si nuestros estudiantes llevamos la comida a nuestra mesa, estaremos contribuyendo a la seguridad alimentaria 
e incluso a la economía local. Esta Huerta de la Esperanza es el vehículo perfecto para la educación nutricional de estudiantes y familias. Hi, my name is Kocho Jeric. I'm from Belgrade, Serbia. In Belgrade, Well done to our team in Colombia who were improving food security there. Great collaborative effort. Okay, so uh, I'm going to hand over to Lynn. Lynn, if you're okay to do our uh, final announcements of our winners today. Yeah, I'm so excited to announce the finals. Um, the first one is the secondary, and it's Coca Derek from Serbia, and it's time to breathe easier. Hi, my name is Kocha Jeric. I'm from Belgrade, Serbia. In Belgrade, we're facing multiple sustainability challenges, the biggest of them being air pollution. High quality air is essential to a sustainable life. Unfortunately, this issue is being neglected time and time again and has led to many protests in the capital. How did a small country from the Balkans become so polluted and how can we achieve a better quality of air in the future? The last few years, heavy pollution started being noticed in Belgrade which signaled the degree of the problem, but the data is unmistakable and it shows Serbia's annual average PM 2.5 concentration, which emerged to be 23 micrograms per meter cubed, which is more than double than the international guideline limit for PM 2.5 of 10 micrograms per meter cubed. Primary air pollutants are airborne particle matter, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide and many others. Air pollution stems from a range of sources with Serbia's reliance on lignite and coal-fueled powered stations in addition to the burning of solid fuels such as coal and wood to heat homes. Adding to, the, to these are pollution emissions from an aging transport fleet. The biggest industrial locations that are contributing to air pollution in Serbia include petrochemical complex around the cities of Pančevo and Novi Sad, factories producing cement in Popovac, Kosjeric and Belchin. The biggest contributor to the pollution from the energy sector are lignite powered thermal plants at Obrenovac, Lazarevac and Kostolac, which emit most of the sulfur dioxide in Serbia. The best solution to this problem is for Serbia to switch to re renewable energy, which we are slowly seeing, and for the industrial locations to renovate, add filters, and to switch from lignite coal to anthracite coal until Serbia has fully switched to reusable energy. Some of the ways you can help the battle against pollution are riding your bike to school, uh, recycling, and many other things you can see in the description. Okay, so a big well done to Kocha there from Serbia for winning our first prize in the secondary category. Uh, so, of course, now we are going on to our grand prize winner overall, which goes to Andrea Visvanathan from the Seychelles for the primary sector for my local sustainability I'm challenges. Andrea. A nine-year-old EFI student from Seychelles. I am with you today to report about the challenges here in Seychelles concerning the sustainability of our coral reefs. Coral reefs are the most diverse marine ecosystems on the planet. They cover only 1% of the ocean floor, but 25% of all fish species spend at least part of their life cycle in this ecosystem. Coral reefs are ecologically and economically valuable, which through tourism and fisheries generate billions of dollars and create jobs. Unfortunately, coral reefs are severely threatened here in Seychelles. Some threats are natural, such as diseases, predators, storms, and climate change. Other threats are caused by humans, including sedimentation, unsustainable fishing practices, pollution, etc., which is raising ocean temperatures and causing ocean acidification. Coral reef depletion and limited recovery may threaten many regions that inhabit them and the communities near them. When they support fear of fish, plants and animals, it affects the attraction of tourist destinations like Seychelles, impact on island nation with lesser fishing and shoreline erosion. 
Most corals contain an algae called zooxanthellae, which produces oxygen and gives the beautiful colors to the corals. With the global warming, these algae are expelled and result in coral bleaching. In late 90s, the unusual warming made El Nino bleach over 90% of the Seychelles corals. As oceans absorb carbon dioxide produced by fossil fuels, they become more acidic. This affects the ability of corals to grow their skeletons and form the foundation for coral reefs. In order to curb the impact of coral, government regulates the environment and fishing practices in Seychelles through the ministries of environment and blue economy and other agencies. Other organizations in Seychelles have taken the following actions to mitigate coral bleaching and rescue corals. Introduce a new coral reef policy, restoration of coral using heat resilient super corals, aquaculture farms for future corals, repair coral bleaching damage, creation of marine protected areas and coral gardening, encourage to use non-toxic ocean safe sunscreen. Despite all these initiatives from Seychelles, mitigating global warming and protecting coral reefs are everyone's responsibility. Therefore, make your travels more eco-friendly. Don't fish a boat near a coral reef. Snorkel and scuba dive with care. Avoid touching coral reefs. Educate people about coral reefs. The whole world population should do their best to reduce the CO2 emission and maintain a sustainable environment for the survival of the future generation. Living in a wetland, Kaduela, a small village. Okay, so I think we need to say a great big well done to everybody for taking part. Some amazing entries there. I'm sure everybody will all agree. Uh, I'm going to now hand over to Kirsty, who will say a few final words. Thank you. Apologies for the slightly uh, delayed video stopping and starting there, but thank you everyone for bearing with me. Uh, yeah, what an amazing group of students that have participated in this competition. We had such a range of topics being covered from expired medicines and water pollution through to how we can save energy in our schools and how our schools can help to impact our wider communities as we saw through the community vegetable garden. So a huge thank you to everyone participating, the students, the teachers and parents, I suspect at schools that help them to prepare these entries as well. And also to our judges who have taken the time to watch these videos, share their comments and also share the sustainability challenges that they are working on as well. Okay, so I would also like to uh, say a big thank you again to everyone for everybody who took part and especially to our speakers and our judges for taking the time out to be involved in today. I know it was a lot of effort for some of you, especially joining from uh, various parts of the world. So thank you very much uh, for both myself and Kirsty. Um, we'll be following up with the teacher champion of champions of our finalists to ensure the students receive their certificates in recognition of their hard work and also with our winners to organize their prizes our overall winner will be receiving 500 pounds uh, the top three entrants across both age categories will be receiving a zoo lab live premium package online session for those not familiar zoo lab is who i work for we take animals small animals in uh, invertebrates mostly out to schools we also now deliver these sessions online so you will be receiving some uh, an online animal session to your class um, for fourth and fifth place winners we re you'll receive a 30 minute zoo lab live online lesson for your class wonderful fantastic prizes then georgie for all of our top entrants so all of our top 24 entries, including our finalists and honourable mentions, are going to be made available as video resources on the TSL community platform because we believe they've got such valuable learning resource material to them so that they can be used by teachers and young people around the world to explore the different sustainability challenges that are being faced in different parts of the world. As we started out thinking about sustainability being a global challenge, many of the issues and some of the solutions are much more locally focused. And it was great to see the students being able to share these innovative solutions as well. So thank you everybody for joining us. If you've enjoyed this competition, you might also like to take part in our international student essay competition, which is focusing on how young people can be better supported to thrive in green jobs. We've had some excellent examples of uh, speakers that are working in green jobs that might have started to inspire you today. 
Uh, entry is open for that now and closes on the 11th of January. You can see the TSL website for more details. We're also going to be launching the third instalment of our latest podcast series, Speaking of Sustainability, in early January as well. Also sticking with the theme of green jobs, as well as some other environmental education webinars and events that we've got planned for 2023. So keep an eye on the TSL website for more details. I can see we've got a hand raised. Kodja, do you want to ask a question? Ask a question? Well, first of all, I, I want to thank you, but uh, I'm not. Uh, I, I I'm not sure I understood. Uh, who won the the grand prize? So Anthea, uh, sorry, Andrea was our grand prize winner from the Seychelles. You were first place in the secondary category, so you were our first place runner up uh, overall. And Andrea from the Seychelles was our grand prize winner. Yeah, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Some nice comments coming through in the chat as well. So congratulations to all of our teacher champions uh, for the excellent work they've created uh, or helped their students to create as well. Congratulations to all of our entrants, all of our honourable mentions, all of our finalists, and of course, our grand prize winners as well. Thank you everybody for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed this. We'll make this recording available uh, on the TSL community platform for you as well if you want to watch back. But huge congratulations to Andrea. Actually, Andrea is with us. Andrea, would you like to... Come on and say a little, a few little words. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you for giving me this opportunity to show my view about like how I feel about our ecosystems here in Seychelles. Thank you very much for that. Oh. Thank you, Andrea. Um, would Coach Coach like to say some a few words as well? Well, I'm just thankful because I, uh, I I was participating in the essay competition and I just love doing these competitions and it's been a lot of fun and it's been a, a very interesting competition to say the least. Good. Well, thank you both so much for participating. It's been great to have you sharing your thoughts with us and also the wider world. That's one of the reasons that uh, TSL and Zulab are working to promote youth voices because we do feel that you've got very important things to say, addressing these uh, challenges and also providing some of the solutions of the future as well. So congratulations to all of our students. Thank you very much everybody for joining us. Huge thanks to our judges and speakers, Ingrid, Anthea and Lynn as well. And again, congratulations to Andrea, our grand prize winner, Susan and Lyndon and her teachers I think are with us as well. So congratulations to you for excellent work uh, with promoting sustainability education in the Seychelles as well. Thank you very much everyone. We look forward to seeing you at the next TSL and Zoolab collaboration. Keep your eyes peeled on the TSL website for more details for what's coming up in 2023. Thank you, everybody. Thanks very much for joining and for all your support. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.